All right, first slide. Yes, I've got a whole bunch of prefixes, root words, suffixes, whichever you want to call them, that you're going to see in this unit. And what are the first three all mean? They all mean muscle. I know I have this listed on my next slides, too. Anytime you see MY, MYS, or SARCO, it means muscle. So you're going to see MY, MYS, and SARCO in a whole bunch of the words you're going to see throughout this PowerPoint. It just means they're relating to muscle. Um, you're going to see a word today that means sarcolemma. What does that mean? It's muscle membrane. Um, instead of saying the plasma membrane of a muscle cell, we just call it the sarcolemma, and it's implied then that is the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. We just give it its own name. It's still the same phospholipid bilayer. It still has the various proteins in it. It's still a plasma membrane, um, but we just call it a specific sarcolemma. Um, you're going to see ISO. I don't think we'll get to some of these words today. You'll see ISO means the same tone, um, means tension or muscle tone. Um, anytime you have METR, for, it's almost like metric, it's measurements. And we're going to use it in relating to measurements of length. Anytime something ends in gram, it's a record of something. Like an electrocardiogram, it's a record of the electricity in the heart. If I say it right, Mike. Um, tetan means tension. And so like a tetanus, we'll talk a little about that next, next time. I don't think we'll get to it today. Glyc means sugar and lysis means to break apart. But I know we're going to get through some of those first ones today. So muscle tissue is nearly half of your body's mass. So nearly half of you is muscle tissue. It's, you know, one of its job is to take chemical energy in the form of ATP and turn it into mechanical energy, meaning we're going to do something. Our muscle's going to move. We're going to do something. Now, the three types of muscle tissue, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. And yes, there was my my. Myo, Miss, and Sark all have to do with prefixes for muscles. Um, and so some of this is review even from lab stuff, just the differences looking at the different types of muscle tissues. The first one, skeletal muscle, which is going to be the main one we focus on. Um, based on its name, it attaches organs. Um, are, you know, like it's organs that are attached to bones and or skin, so it helps attach. Um, they're elongated cells, so they're very, very long cells, we'll talk about those later too, called muscle fibers. So the cells are so long, instead of calling them just a cell and imagining like a little round cell, we call them a muscle fiber. They are a cell, but they're so long, they look like a big fiber. Um, they're striated, which means they appear striped. They're voluntary, which means they appear, you know, we can control them. They contract very, very quickly. They, however, then tire very, very quickly. They're very powerful at what you can lift. You know, I'm like, if you put enough all your muscle energies together, you can lift a car. Um, requires, it does require nervous system stimulation. It does require us telling our muscles to contract, to move something for our skeletal muscles. And they are multinucleate. They have lots and lots of nuclei. And again, that comes from how they were developed in embryo too. The cardiac muscle, only place you find in the entire body, the heart. Um, it also is striated. It can contract without nervous system stimulation. So we don't have to tell it what to do. It's involuntary. Um, there's no nervous system saying what to do. There are cells inside of the heart called pacemaker cells that tell the heart to beat. Um, it's uninucleate. Some cells in the heart can be binucleate and they can have two nuclei. Otherwise, most of them are uni. And they contain inter intercalated discs. Which do they look like? What do the intercalated discs look like? I was going to say, they're not white. They, they, they no. stain really, really dark. Yeah. And I'm like, so when you're looking at muscle tissue, because this picture still looks familiar, I think, from the right. lab, um, there are those dark staining bands. Because again, anytime you see striations or stripes, you know it's either going to be skeletal or cardiac. You can look to see that, yes, skeletal has lots and lots of nuclei. They hang out on the edges. Whereas cardiac muscles have one, sometimes two, nuclei. They usually hang out in the middles of the cell, but they've got these dark, it also branches, but they've got those dark staining intercalated discs. And then smooth muscle, we find them in the walls of hollow organs, Mike, such as your stomach, the bladder, the airway. The main job of smooth muscle is to move some type of fluid or substance. So we could be moving fluids, we could, you know, but if it's 
through the bladder. It's moving urinary system. You don't have this? I went backwards. It wasn't right after cardiac? No. There's like two slides that are on top of each other, kind of. Oh, really? Like, I think that it's supposed to say We don't have that, so if we could like just right have here. a second. Come here. Come here. Oh. It says types of muscle tissues, like, on the tops of these two. Like, somehow. Oh, yeah, the picture got put over it. On where? Right here, it starts saying it at the top. You can, oh, oh so, you, Money. No, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we don't have it. I don't know. Yeah, let me get to the smooth muscle. That's weird, I'll have to try to get that fixed ASAP. Where am I? So it's in the walls of hollow organs. Again, it's there to move some type of fluid, some type of substance. If it's in the airway, it's to move air. If it's in the bladder, it's to move urine. If it's in the stomach, it's to move food and liquids. Like, but the smooth muscle helps move things through those organs. Smooth muscle is involuntary, which means we have no control over it. It, you know, it does its own thing, moving those fluids and or substance through it. And it has just one single nuclei, similar to the skeleton, uh, to the cardiac muscle. What does fusiform mean on the next slide? It's a single fusiform human nucleus and skeleton. Smooth muscle. Under smooth, yeah, right here. Right here. Right, uh, right above that picture of the. Oh my god, I cannot remember, but I'm like, I remember this term. That's why I'm going to say, I'm like, but you would think that's what it means, but I'm like, I can't remember. Like, I know that word, but I can't think of what it means right now. No, I wouldn't ask on it. It's going to bug me now because I'm like, oh my goodness, where have I used the word before? Well, I'll try to use it in a sentence tomorrow. Like, word of the day. All right, so this looks like, again, looks like lab. Yes, you'll have to be able to identify the different types of muscle tissue. Skeletal muscle versus cardiac muscle versus smooth muscle. Again, the biggest distinguishing characteristic of smooth muscle, there are no striations on it. They also, like, they are elongated cells. Again, they kind of look like a little football that's been stretched very, very skinny. So it's a very long, kind of oval-looking shape. Some other differences on it. Again, this is all on page the 310 through 311, comparing some of the differences on these. Now, as we go through some of these muscles, we'll look at some of the differences. Um, what did I want to know? I was going to say, I'm like, well, this kind of, you know, yes, skeletal muscle is voluntary. We can control it. There are some reflexes in your skeletal muscle that are involuntary. Um, we'll talk more about some of that stuff later on. Um, we're also going to start talking about sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium, um, speeds of contraction. Now, your skeletal muscle contracts the fastest. Yes, we do have some skeletal muscle that contracts slow, but in general, your skeletal muscle can contract very, very quickly. Any guess where one of the fastest contracting muscles is in your body, skeletal muscle-wise? Yeah, your eyelids are the fastest contracting ones. Um, and so they can contract very, very quickly. However, it might be also, you know, <laughs> tire quickly too. Your cardiac muscle and your smooth muscle contract very, very slowly. 
And I'm like, yes, your heart can beat harder and faster, but I'm like, it's still not going to contract really, really quickly. I'm like, where it's not just going to have these super fast, rapid heartbeats. Um, otherwise, you're not going to get blood flow going through the heart like it should. All right, some other characteristics of muscle tissue. One, it's excitable, which means it can re respond to some type of stimuli. The stimuli might be some type of neurotransmitter. It might be some type of chemical signal like a neurotransmitter. It might be an action potential. Um, but it's going to be able to respond to some type of information. It's also contractible, which means it can shorten forcefully when stimulated. If I send that type of stimuli to my muscle, that muscle can shorten and it can lift something up. I can shorten forcefully. Um, that's something that none of the other muscle tissues can do. They're not going to shorten, you know, I'm like, when stimulated, they're not going to be able to generate, ton, you know, this force by shortening. Um, extensible, they can be stretched beyond resting length. I'm like, when you're sitting there, most of your muscles are at resting length. You can take it, then you can stretch your arms out even further. A lot of times this feels really good. You know, when you sleep all night long, all your muscles are at resting length. Well, the first thing you may do in the morning is stretch all those muscles out past your resting length. And then after you're done stretching, then the elasticity part of the muscle characteristic comes in, and then it recoils and goes back to its resting length. So you can stretch it, that's the extensible, and then it's going to go right back, just like a rubber band. All right, four important muscle functions. There's other additional functions they do, but the four main important muscle functions, movement of bones and or fluids. So if it's in the heart, it's going to be blood. It could be food, again, it could be air. It could be, you know, anything, you know, moving some type of substance. Um, it could be moving bones. It helps maintain our posture and our body position. It helps stabilize joints. And it helps in heat generation, especially your skeletal muscles. So when you go outside, and it's cold outside, um, and you start to get cold, you might start to jump up and down and don't even realize that you're now jumping up and down. It's to generate a little bit more heat. Now, some of the other functions that are not quite as important for survival, um, it helps protect some organs. You probably all at some, had someone at some point be like, Come on, punch me in the gut. Yeah, or seen this happen, you know? And you could, I'm like, you could punch someone in the gut if they were contracting all of their muscles. And I'm like, that's protecting, and when those muscles are contracted and a little more firm, I'm like, it's going to protect those internal organs. Um, they help form some of the valves in our blood vessels, they control pupil size, and they can also cause goosebumps. Not really, you know, essential to survival. Now, skeletal muscle, which is going to be the main one we focus on, especially today and even next on Wednesday. Um, there are different connective tissue sheets that go around the skeletal muscle. There's, you know, there's support cells. We'll get into that later that also can help reinforce the muscle itself. But the, the connective tissues starting on the outside that goes around the entire muscle itself is the epimysium. Now, where it says where it may blend with the fascia, this is the tissue that connects muscle to skin. And so you might have the epimysium blending right there. Paramysium, this is the connective tissue that goes around fascicles or groups of muscle fibers. And then endomysium is the most inner of the connective tissue. It goes around each individual muscle fiber or muscle cell. Again, anytime I talk about muscle fiber, I'm talking about one really long cell. So looking at the different types of tissue layers, I'm like, yes, on the whole outside of the actual muscle itself, you have that epimysium. Inside of the muscle, you have all these little bundles. In this picture, they look more oval. Each one of these bundles, that's a fascicle surrounding, this is my big old fascicle coming out at us. Surrounding it, you have perimysium. Inside the fascicle, you have more little bundles. Each one of these is one muscle fiber, one muscle cell. And like you got those nuclei, you can see the little purple ovals on the outside. And surrounding each one, each muscle fiber is the endomysium. Now, and I'm like, when we look at muscle tissue itself, it almost looks like tubes inside of, you know, groups of tubes inside of groups of tubes inside of groups of tubes. It is. Even the muscle fiber itself, one muscle cell, has a whole bunch of these little fibrils, which looks like more little tiny tubes all bundled together in there. Now, a couple other terminology. Yes, you're going to have to know these. Highlight these. 
Um, one, I'm like, when we talk about skeletal muscle, because this is also a lab, and I'm like, you're, you're lucky you don't have to know all the attachments and insertions. Um, depending on certain classes and where you take anatomy, sometimes we'll make you <laughs> learn them all. Um, you just have to know the names of the muscles. All skeletal muscles have an insertion and they have an origin. And I'm like, it's where, you know, one side of the muscle versus the other side of the muscle. The question is, which one is the insertion and which one is the origin? The insertion side of the muscle is usually the one that's on more, the more movable of the bone. So the end of the muscle, you know, I'm like, it's going to be moving here. So I'm like, if I've got a muscle that's attaching, going from my humerus down to, say, my radius, if my radius is moving, the part that's attached to the radius would be the insertion, the more movable of the part. And then the origin will be the less movable attachment site, so the less movable bone. Um, sometimes the bone itself doesn't even move at all. Sometimes it does, but so even movable or less movable. Now, the attachments from muscle to bone can be either direct or indirect. Direct means that muscle itself, that epimysium on the outside of the muscle tissue, fuses directly to the bone, the periosteum, the outside covering the bone, fuses directly to the bone itself, or it fuses to perichondrium, which is the outer part of cartilage. And Mike, so the muscle attaches directly onto bone or directly onto cartilage. An indirect attachment of muscle means all that outside connective tissue covering all comes together and forms a tendon, and I'm like, and that tendon will attach to bone, or it forms something known as a, like, it's called a, it's a sheet-like tendon known as aponeurosis, I'm like, and that attaches muscle to bone or muscle to muscle. Now, I, I inserted this picture, so I know you don't have it, and so just so you're like, oh, what does this mean, direct and indirect? If we're looking at this particular muscle, first, what's this bone? That's your scapula. If you notice, there's muscles inside of here. On one side of it, this muscle is attached directly to bone. That's a direct attachment, muscle straight onto bone. At the other end, I'm like, all the epimysium that's on the outside of this muscle, all that epimysium comes together and forms a little rope-like tendon, and that tendon then attaches to bone onto the humerus right there. Now, when I talked about an aponeurosis, because this is one you learn in the lab today, we'll review it on the cadaver, this is a sheet-like tendon, I'm like, where you have a whole bunch of this epimysium all coming together, and it forms one big, huge sheet-like tendon. That's an aponeurosis. Now, sometimes it attaches just muscle to muscle, sometimes muscle to bone. But that would be an indirect attachment versus directly attaching right to bone itself. All right, organization of the muscle itself. Now, I said, I'm like, it's like bundles inside bundles or little, you know, circles inside circles. So again, we've got that epimysium looking inside the actual whole muscle itself. We've got little bundles called fascicles. If I zoom in on my one fascicle inside that fa the fascicle, I have more little circles. And each one of these circles is a muscle fiber. Now we're going to zoom in on that muscle fiber. Here's my muscle fiber inside of it. Or more little tube looking things called myofibrils. Now we're going to zoom in on a myofibril. Once we start looking at myofibrils, although you can also see it in the muscle fiber itself, what do you start noticing about its appearance? This is where you can start to see those striations on the muscle cells. And if we zoom in, which we're going to, we can see dark band, light band, dark band, light band. Um, and we're going we're gonna to focus a lot on you know, how muscles contract and what's actually happening inside of each one of the myofibrils inside of a muscle cell, a muscle fiber. Now, if I look at this one sarcomere and I zoom in, okay, and I got my dark bands and light bands on the end, here would be this dark band and the lighter bands on either end. This is one sarcomere. Again, we'll get into more of this in a little bit. And we have thick and thin filaments. The thick filament is my red. That's known as myosin. The thin filament is my bluish purple. That's the actin. And again, we'll look at the structures, a little more of the structures of the actin and the myosin today. All right, so some terminology or some basic things about your muscle cells or the muscle fibers, whichever way you want me to say it. Um, one, they're very, very long. They're cylindrical cells. They're round. They look like little big, long tubes. Um, and they can be, you know, between 10 and 100 micrometers in diameter. 
They're not very wide. However, they can be up to 30 centimeters long. Again, one muscle fiber, one muscle cell runs the entire length of the muscle. So the longest muscle in your body goes from your hip to the inside of your knee? Sartorius. And I'm like, and so every single muscle cell or muscle fiber in that actual muscle, muscle itself runs that entire length of that muscle. So you can have very long cells. They're very thin, but they're very long. They have multiple nuclei on the edges, so they've got multiple peripheral nuclei. Um, the outside plasma membrane we call the sarcolemma. The cytoplasm on the inside of the cell we call a sarcoplasm. Again, it just means the cytoplasm of a muscle cell. It's called sarcoplasm. And then different structures, some we'll talk about right now, others we're going to talk about shortly, um, myofibrils, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and your T-tubules. Now, inside that muscle fiber, one muscle cell, you've got a whole bunch of little tube-looking things. Those are those myofibrils. Again, if I look back, I'm like, here's my muscle fiber, my muscle cell. There's my muscle cell. And inside of it, it is jam-packed with, with those myofibrils. So it's jam-packed with myofibrils. Here's my other zoomed in. One muscle cell, less blurry, whole bunch of myofibrils. So inside my cell, you know, 80% of what's inside of the cell are myofibrils. Again, what does the myo part mean? It means muscle. So again, you see myo and sarco all over these words. Um, these myofibrils contain sarcomeres. I'm like, those are those repeating dark light bands. Sarcomeres contain myofilaments. Again, myo just means muscles. The filaments are, are actin and myosin. And yes, you have those striations, the dark and light bands. I'm like, the dark band are those dark stripes. I'm like, we call this an A band, and I'll zoom in on what actually is happening in A band. Um, the light colors, they're your I bands. Now, what am I? Here we go. And I'm like, so some other things that we're going to see inside of here. So I'm going to zoom in on one myofibril. So I'm going to take one myofibril. Here we go. One myofibril. Now I've got one sarcomere right in the middle, but my sarcomeres do, you know, they run almost like in a boxcar fashion. One sarcomere, next sarcomere, next sarcomere. It's just like a train, one right after the next. Now, in my myofibril, I have a couple different zones. I have a couple different bands. First, I have, first, what's my, what's the red? Yeah, the myosin, the thick filament, and the blue? Actin. The actin are the thin filaments. Now, and I'm like, where I have my little H zone, I have myosin there. However, what am I missing in my H zone? What's not there? Actin or myosin? Yeah, I have no actin in my H zone. Now, and I'm like, what's eventually going to happen is my actins, they're going to start to move closer, and they're gonna, we're actually going to try to get rid of our H zone. And I'm like, those two actin, these two blue little lines right there, are actually going to creep right towards that very, very center of the H zone, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, at the ends of each sarcomere, where I have different actin actin myofilaments attached to each other. We call them the Z-discs. Sometimes, depending on your book, they call it a Z-line. Z-line, Z-discs, Z-something. Uh, we have our thick filaments. That's our myosin. They run the entire length of what's known as the A-band. The A-band is just that how long that myosin is. On either side, we have I-bands. All you're going to find inside the I-bands are what? It's just the actin. The Z-disc is also right in the middle of an I-band, but all you're going to find inside of there is actin molecules. So they run the entire length of an I-band, and they go also partly into an A-band. And the sarcomere is, oh, I already said that, Mike, it just goes from one Z-disc to the next Z-disc. So lots of terminology on this page. So this might not be a ba bad page to, like, you know, dog ear the page in case you need to flip back to it, and you're like, what is that A-band again? What's the Z-line? Um, yeah. 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 
Okay, I was gonna say, like bottom where? Oh, okay. Oh, right. And I'm like, and part of that, you just have to know, like, okay, the thick filament that myosin runs the entire length of an A band. So an A band is just showing you where that whole thick filament is. Yep. Uh, the sarcomere, again, that's one part where it goes Z disc to Z disc. It's the smallest contractile unit of a muscle fiber. It aligns along a myofibril. I already said, like, boxcars of a train, one right next to each other. Again, one sarcomere contains an entire A band. And it contains half of this I band, and it contains half of this I band. So one I band is actually split. You know, half of it belongs to one sarcomere, half of it belongs to the other sarcomere. And it has both thick and thin myofilaments made of contractile proteins. So actin and myosin are proteins that are going to contract. They're going to shorten when we tell them to do what we want them to do. I don't know if we get to today. If I zoom in on my sarcomere, again, I have my dark myosin. Now, cool thing about the little myosin, and we'll look about structure, one of these, oh yeah, we're coming up. Um, it has these cool little heads on it. They just look, I don't know, kind of cool. Um, at the, and at the actin, we've got the blue on there. Now, my little note, we also found at the ends of the myosin and at the ends of the actin, you have elastic filaments. They're called titan. Now, based on the shape, what do you think they do? Springs. Yeah, they're almost like little springs. And I'm like, so that when we start stretching our muscles and contracting our muscles, they can help pull it back, just like that rubber band effect. When we stretch our muscles, they're going to go right back. Um, that's your elastic, hence the name elastic filaments. It's called titan protein. I think it's very strong. I know I mentioned that coming up somewhere too. All right, so looking at the thick filament, looking at the thin filament. Now, the thick filament is the myosin, the thin is the actin. Um, to remember both, myosin is one letter bigger than actin. If you counted how many letters, one has six, one has five. Um, so myosin, which is one extra letter, and it is a thick filament, and it is thicker. It's got all those cool heads on it. And like, actin is thinner, and it's the smaller of the two words. It is made up of protein called myosin. Now, the myosin tail, because this myosin has, has a head and it has tail. Now, the myosin tail has two interwoven heavy polypeptide chains. Now, do you remember what a polypeptide eventually makes? It makes a protein. It's made up, you know, the whole myosin is protein. So the tail itself has two intertwining polypeptide chains. Really, we don't really care that much all about the head, uh, the tails. It also has two heads. So it has two smaller light polypeptide chains, it's in the smaller part. Um, they act as cross bridges during, for cross bridges during contraction. It is on these heads, on the myosin heads, this is what's actually going to attach onto actin. If you even notice, on top of the myosin head, it has an actin binding site. Now, I'm like, the head part, this is the business end of the myosin. It's what's doing stuff. The tail, really, we could care less about. But it's on this head. You have an actin binding site, and you have ATP binding site. Like, so you've got two different things going on on the head. Tail, nothing. Um, but we're going to, on that head, ATP is going to bind there, and we're going to also attach onto actin and help shorten those sarcomeres. The thin filament, the actin, it also is a twisted double strand. To me, it looks like little tiny blueberries on these pictures. They're always in blue. They look like little tiny blueberries. Now, on the actual, each one of these little, they're called actin subunits, they're all little proteins. On each one of them, it has a little circle, a little indent. These are active sites for myosin attachment. Because what's going to attach there? The little myosin head. That actin binding site on myosin is going to attach right to that active site on actin. It's like active site because stuff's going to happen there. Now, you can see the little indents on all of those little actin molecules all put together. Now, can you fully see the active sites on actin? Are they exposed? No, and I'm like, at rest, all of the active sites are covered up by this brown structure called tropomyosin. So all the active sites are covered up by tropomyosin. There's also another protein. These are both proteins. 
called troponin that helps anchor the tropomyosin there to block the active sites. So we call tropomyosin and troponin regulatory, regulatory proteins. They're bound on to actin. Their main job is to cover all those active sites. That becomes important. Muscles are not going to contract if the active sites are covered up because myosin can't attach to those active sites. And the myosin covers them up and troponin helps anchor it there. Uh, just the same picture. Here is my other, you know, a couple other terms. That elastic filament, that's your titan. That's that thing that helps stretch. You may want to throw on there, titan is your elastic filament. Helps hold those thick filaments in place and helps recoil after stretching to help resist excessive stretching and overstretching of your muscles. Again, it's like the little elastic cord right there. And then you also have something known as dystrophin. Yes, you're going to have to know these, highlight these. Um, dystrophin. These are proteins, I'm like, well, say it's a protein that helps anchor the thin filaments, or actin, to proteins of the sarcolemma. What's the sarcolemma again? The yes, the muscle cell membrane. Again, if you remember, when we talked about cells, you've got proteins on your in your actual plasma membranes. They can help anchor things. You know, those proteins are just there for anchoring. Well, dystrophin helps anchor actin to those proteins on the actual membrane itself so that everything is still attached to that muscle cell. So stuff is not just loose inside your muscle cells. It is anchored to that muscle cell membrane using that dystrophin. Now, sarcoplasmic reticulum, a couple other terms before we get to actually how a muscle contracts. Sarcoplasmic reticulum, on my picture it's in blue. It's a network of smooth endoplasmic reticulum, hence its name. It's, that's where we get the reticulum from. Um, it surrounds each myofibril. So you have to remember, this whole thing, here's my sarcolemma, the outside of it, which goes all the way around, it's coming at you. And you've got a whole bunch of myofibrils packing in inside that muscle cell. These are all the myofibrils. Surrounding each myofibril is this blue stuff, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, most of it runs lengthwise with the actual myofibrils itself. However, we have some perpendicular parts where it runs at the end. Um, they, they form a pair of terminal cisterni. What does terminal mean? The end. And am I at the end? Now, I, if you notice, this is lining up with a sarcomere. Here's my Z disc, Z disc. If I follow it down, along the Z disc is where you're going to have these terminal cisterni, where the actual sarcoplasmic reticulum runs perpendicular to the myofibrils. So you got stuff happening along those Z discs, the end of the sarcomeres. I was going to say, Mike, I know I've got in here. It, it just shows you've got two terminal cisterni, one on either side of this white structure called the T-tubule. Now, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, highlight this last bullet, its main job is to regulate intracellular calcium levels. It stores calcium. It can release calcium. It holds on to calcium until it's told to release it. Its main job is to regulate calcium levels. Got that? Sarcoplasmic reticulum. Maintain and regulate calcium levels because calcium is going to be a big one coming to muscle contraction. And then those T-tubules that you find right smack dab in the middle of that sarcoplasmic reticulum, they are a continuation of the sarcolemma. So that plasma membrane, there's a hole inside the plasma membrane of your muscle cells, and it indents and forms a tube going all the way through. And so you have a tube that runs right along all the Z-discs. So at the end, every single Z-disc, you're going to have a T-tubule. Now, because you have one T-tubule in the middle and two terminal cisterni of the sarcoplasmic reticulum on either side, we call this a triad. So what does tri mean? Three, the three things. You've got a terminal cisterni of the sarcoplasmic reticulum on either side of that T-tubule. Main job, I'm like, yes, it is. since it is continuous with the sarcolemma, anything that's outside of the actual muscle itself so extracellular um, fluid, extracellular ions um, can enter into the cell through that T-tubule, and it increases the surface area of the actual cell membrane itself.
there's my little, there's the continuation of the sarcoma. You can see the indent. It was kind of tucked down on the bottom there. I'm trying to figure out how much we're going to get through today and where I want to stop. All right. Well, we'll look, start talking about how it is that we've shortened muscles. It's called the sliding filament model of contraction. Its main job is to generate force. Now, generating force does not necessarily cause the shortening of the actual muscle fiber itself. Where have I had an example? I never bring something appropriate. Um, <laughs> for example, I'm going to hold this water bottle. I need something else that weighs something. My muscle's not moving, correct? I'm just holding it. I could try to now hold this. Is my muscle moving? Did my muscle change length by adding more onto my muscle itself? No. However, to lift that extra weight, not that it weighs that much, but imagine it weighs like 50 pounds. But to generate, you know, to hold that extra weight, my muscle has to generate more force. It doesn't mean my muscle's going to shorten, but to hold the same, you know, to hold increased amount of weight, yes, you're going to have to generate more force. So that's the same thing. You probably all have, you know, had it where, you know, you're, someone's like, here, carry this, and you're like, okay, and then they keep stacking book more and more books on your arms. Well, you're going to have to generate more and more force without shortening your arms itself. You're not trying to, like, you know, weight lift the books, unless you are, um, but you're generally not trying to weight lift the books. And yes, your muscles can generate, you know, just enough force. And if they put one too many books on your arms, what will happen? Yeah, your arms will give out. I'm like, you know, there is, you know, a maximum number, a maximum amount of force that your muscles can generate. Um, then you can work out and other stuff like that, but we're not getting into that. But just because I'm like, you know, I'm like, our muscles can generate force. That doesn't always mean they're going to shorten. I'm like, I can sit here and push on the wall. And different, you know, I can just like lightly touch on the wall or I could really, you know, try to shove on the wall. I'm generating different amounts of force without actually shortening my arms because the wall's not going to move. Um, the shortening of the actual muscles occurs when the tension that's generated by your cross bridges, by that myosin attaching to actin, when it exceeds the force that opposes the shortening. There's something that's going to oppose the shortening, you know, that's going to say we don't want to shorten. If I can cause that myosin head to work farther against that, the muscles will then contract and it will shorten. My, but in general, our muscles don't really want to contract and shorten because it, it's, extra, it's extra energy. Now, in a relaxed state, state, when you're not trying to lift weights or anything, your thick and your thin filaments overlap only at the ends of an A-band. So here's your little A band right there, there's your thick filament right in the middle of it, running the whole length of your A band. And you've got a little bit of the actin overlapping at the ends of the A band. What's going to happen when your muscles contract? So this is a fully relaxed. Here's a fully contracted. During contraction, that actin, the actin molecule, so this actin and this actin are going to move. They're going to get ratcheted closer and closer towards each other. So they're getting ratcheted closer and closer towards each other. So the A band, and I'm like, that myosin, did the A band change length? No. Nope. A band did not change length. Why? What's in the A band? The myosin. The myosin itself does not change length. It stays the exact same length. The only thing that happened to cause your sarcomere to shorten is that the actin gets closer and closer together, and you lose this what's this H zone. And I'm like, where you did have space where there wasn't any actin, well, we don't have any space where there's no actin anymore. The actin has completely gone towards the middle. You would still see some, because you're still going to have spaces where you don't have myosin. It's a good idea. You would see less striations, if that makes sense. And I'm like, but you would still see striations. Um, so when you have a fully contracted muscle, the only thing that shortens is the sarcomere itself. The actin just gets closer and closer together. So that's why they call it the sliding filament model of contraction. These actins slid past myosin closer to each other. Now, what's going to cause the actin to slide? Those little myosin heads, the business end of the myosin, are going to grab onto the actin and ratchet them 
these two things, they go like this. I can't do that without my hand. They go like this, and they pull the actin closer and closer and closer to the middle of that A band. And it shortens the whole sarcomere. And whatever is happening at this sarcomere is also happening at this next sarcomere. And it's also happening at the next sarcomere. And every single sarcomere is all going to shorten. And that allows your arm to shorten. That muscle shortens because every single one of those sarcomeres shortens at the exact same time. killed my computer. Now it does nothing. There we go. I was going to say it like it's a stupid video. Um, so the cross bridges, and I'm like, that's where your myosin head attaches onto actin. Um, it reaches onto the actin. Here's my myosin. Here's my myosin head attaching onto actin. Again, we still have red and blue. Um, and it ratchets that thin filament closer and closer to the middle. It's called the end line for the middle. And I'm like, and it pulls that actin closer and closer towards the end line, shortening that sarcomere. We are going to watch that happen. Maybe. With a faster computer. Here we go. Stored calcium ions are released into the cytoplasm. Make it bigger. At the start of contraction, I guess. At the start of contraction, stored calcium ions are released into the cytoplasm. Calcium ions expose binding sites on the actin molecules. Globular heads on the myosin can bind to these sites, forming cross bridges. Repeated binding and release moves the filaments relative to one another. And as this occurs simultaneously in many sarcomeres, the entire muscle shortens or contracts. This process requires energy in the form of ATP. I was going to say, I'm like, yeah, I was say, I'm like, I felt like I took longer to upload the video. Um, but then I zoomed in. I'm like, so here's, I kind of like it darker in here. I'm like, here's the fully relaxed sarcomere. Again, you've got a little bit of the actin overlapping with your myosin right there. What we're going to cause it to do, though, is that actin, this actin is going to go towards this M line, the middle. This actin is going to go closer to this M line. And it's because those heads are going to grab onto the actin and yank it this direction. And these heads are going to attach onto that actin and yank them that direction towards the middle. So again, in the end, they're all lined up right there in the middle. Different video. It's as big as in I can make it. In muscle, actin and myosin myofilaments lie side by side and the H zones and I band are at maximum width. During contraction, the actin and myosin myofilaments interact. The actins are pulled toward the center of each myosin myofilament. As a result, the sarcomere is shortened. In the fully contracted muscle, the ends of the actin myofilaments overlap, the H zones disappear, and the I band becomes very narrow. Now, on here, because I'm not going to play it again, I'm like, what color, what color is the myosin? Purple. What color is the actin? The actin is the green. So those myosin heads, the purple on here, is going to grab onto actin, and you can see them move a little bit. They're ratcheting, pulling those green actins towards the middle of the sarcomere. So this actin and this actin are getting closer and closer together. So this H zone goes away. This actin and this actin get closer and closer together, so this H zone goes away. It's those myosin heads that are pulling it. So just watch. Actin and myosin myofilaments lie side by side, and the H zones and I band are at maximum width. During contraction, the actin and myosin myofilaments interact. The actins are pulled toward the center of each myosin myofilament. As a result, the sarcomere is shortened. In the fully contracted muscle, the ends of the actin myofilaments overlap, the H zones disappear, and the I band becomes very narrow. 
And so you saw, they act in, they get right up next to each other. Your muscle can only contract so far. Um, and your H zone goes away. And I'm like, but your myosin itself does not change length. But you actually got to see the little heads grabbing on and ratcheting along. Now, we're going to like preview what we're going to start talking about next time. Now, for a muscle to contract, there are two main processes that have to happen. Activation and then excitation, contraction, coupling. It's like a big mouthful. So for a muscle to contract, two main things have to happen. And so we're going to talk about these two main things next time. We're going to talk about something called activation. It's the whole phase, activation phase. And like, it has to generate an action potential in the sarcolemma. What's the sarcolemma again? Yeah, the muscle membrane. We're going to generate an action potential on the muscle membrane itself. Now, where have you heard of action potentials before? The nervous system. A lot of this is going to sound very, very you know, familiar as we start talking about action potentials and how they move along and the moving of ions. And so we have to generate an action potential. And that information then has to travel along the plasma membrane, get inside the muscle, make calcium levels rise. Now, do you remember what regulates calcium levels? The sarcoplasmic reticulum regulates the calcium levels. And that calcium is really what starts this all off. I mean, calcium, and that's why I even bold them. Like, calcium is going to play a, or made a different color. It's going to play a big role in both, you know, the activation phase and that excitation contraction coupling. A lot of it's calcium. We're going to be following calcium next time. So I've got it in my peach and I've got it in my pink. It's page 286 in your book. Phase one, that's activation. You may even want to write it over on the left-hand side. Phase one, the activation phase. We're going to create an action potential. I'm like, but before we do that, we have to have information coming to the muscle cell membrane from a neuron. So everything that's happening in phase one, this a the activation is happening at the NMJ. What is NMJ? The neuromuscular junction. So this is all happening. Phase one is all happening at the neuromuscular junction. We have information coming from a neuron, and it's sending information to the muscle cell itself. And then phase two, which is that excitation contraction coupling, this is that action potential, travels along, gets into the actual muscle cell through those T tubules, causes calcium to be released, and then we have the shortening of the sarcomeres. So next time we're going to take apart and look at all of these little parts that's happening in an activation in phase one and everything that's happening in the excitation contraction coupling. Now you've already seen some of it because you saw the sarcomere shortening. You know, it's just the question of really what actually causes that is what we're going to talk about. How they, you know, how did this the myosin head grab onto actin and what really causes it to do that. So that's as far as we're getting today.